In his newest book, Gary Wills argues that Christian priests would have been unthinkable to Jesus and most early Christians. Is it so unthinkable to envision a Christian faith without these men of the cloth? Let's ask. In Chicago, Illinois, Gary Wills, author of Why Priests, a Failed Tradition, He's also professor of history at Northwestern University. And Mr. Wills, we welcome you back to TVO. How's it going? It's fine. How are you? Just great. Thank you very much. Maybe we could start by having you tell us why you wrote this book right now. Well, the Christian faith has been plagued by the fact that Christians kill Christians, that we have popes condemning heretics' books and heretics and burning them. We have Protestants in America burning convents. We have Calvinists in New England hanging Quakers. And all of that made me think, why on earth did this happen to the religion of Jesus? Because in the Gospels, in a Gospel that the new Pope just quoted, when Jesus sends out his disciples for the first time, he lets them go and spread the gospel and heal people and ex exclude demons. And he says, well, how did it go? And they said, fine. But we came across a man who was casting out demons, but not in your name, but not among us. He wasn't one of us. And he's, so we stopped him. And he said, well, why did you do that? If he was doing it in my name, he was not against me. Well, the whole history of Christianity has been Christians excluding, condemning, burning other Christians who are not one of us. And I thought, how did that arise? It arose, I think, simply from the fact that an exclusive priesthood grew up. It wasn't there at the outset, which excluded other Christians and, for that matter, laity. If you were not part of the exclusive priesthood, you were not part of the only channel of grace that came down from God to do things like baptize you, marry you, forgive your sins, etc. None of that was there at the outset when St. Paul wrote to his communities. There were no priests there then. And he said, there are many gifts of the Spirit among you. There are healers, readers, preachers, exorcists, speakers in tongues, and among the prophets were women. But all of that got excluded, and there was a monopolistic priesthood that did all of those things that the Spirit had originally done. And so I tried to read history forward. You know, what we Catholics grew up thinking that you should read history backward. If we have it now, because the church never changes, they always had it. If we have popes and priests and sacraments and penance now, then that must have been there at the outset, even though there's no real evidence that that's true. And so I started trying to read history forwards. What were the evidences at certain points? How did the priesthood arise, for instance, among Christians? There were priests in Paul's community but they were the Jewish priests because, remember, Paul was a temple-goer. He was a synagogue-goer. All of the earlier followers of Jesus were. They were Jews, and the only difference from other Jews was that they believed that this Messiah had come and others did not. That would lead to troubles very shortly, but at the outset, everybody went to temple. When Paul came back from his travels, James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, said, well, you're a good Jew, you have to go to the temple to be purified, and he did. Well, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and the Jewish priesthood ended for followers of Jesus as well as for followers of Moses, who were overlapping communities. And another 20 years later, there was a community of followers of Jesus, they were not yet really called Christians, who said, why don't we have sacrifices and priests? Because everybody around us does. The pagans do. Uh, the uh, foreigners do. The Romans do. The Greeks do. Now there was only one way for you to get grace, which was from a priest who got it from the Pope, who got it from God. There was no longer this gifts of the Spirit out among the people. 
And so the Catholic Church closed in upon itself and excluded the Eastern Church, first of all, and of course the Jews, and then heretics like Protestants, Albigensians. Uh, and all of that comes back to what the Pope just cited. Why do you exclude people who do things in my name? If they do it in my name, they're not against me. I think that we, were, we are finally going back to that. We will still have priests. They will be counseled. You know, the people who have said, I want my priests because they've been very good to me. They've counseled me. They've given me moral support. They've given me leadership. Sure, let them do that. The point is that they should not claim to be the only people who can do that, the only conduits of grace through the sacraments, which grew up later also. During the course of so this conversation, this a, if I can, let me just jump in here. During the course of our conversation, I'd like to read from time to time some excerpts from your book, Why Priests? And here's the first one, and then I'll come out of this with a question. Uh, here's the first excerpt. I shall be arguing here, you write, that priesthood, despite the many worthy men who have filled that office, keeps Catholics at a remove from other Christians and at a remove from the Jesus of the Gospels, who was a biting critic of the priests of his day. And I wonder if you could just go into that last sentence a little bit more. How do we know what Jesus thought of the priests of his day? Well, Jesus was a prophet. Uh, and there, the great tradition of the prophets in the Jewish world was that they held the priests accountable because the priests were often ritualists in the sense that if you were not ritualistically purified, then you could not be acceptable to God at temple worship and other things. And Jesus constantly infringed upon temple worship and the rules of cleanliness. Uh, he told people to collect food on the Sabbath. Uh, and in all of this, he was doing what the prophets had done. The prophets said, sacrifice is good, it's commanded by God, but it should never replace the purity of the heart. Good to the people. He said, how can you have priests who deny things to the poor? That's the Jewish prophet message. My message now is how can you have Catholic priests who abuse children? How can they be priests? How can that be pure if they are not following the moral teachings of God and of Jesus. So, of course, as a Jewish prophet, he was a critic of the Jewish priests. That didn't, meant, that didn't mean he eliminated the Jewish priesthood. He let it stand until 70. As I say, all of his fo followers went to temple. Uh, he, Paul was circumcised. Pauline scholars, including Catholics like Raymond Brown, said if he had had a son, he didn't because he was a, he told people he was an exception to the normal rule. He was not going to marry because he was preaching the urgency of the end time. If he had had a son, he would have had him circumcised. He was that much a Jew. Uh, so to say that he was a critic of the priests means of the Jewish priests, but only insofar as all the Jewish prophets were. You mentioned in the midst of that answer the sexual abuse scandal, which of course the church and much of the world has been trying to deal with for a very long time now. And I wonder whether the sexual abuse scandal was in part uh, the reason why you wrote this book. I guess, I mean, was it a response, this book, to the sexual abuse crisis in the church? Well, in a way, I suppose. I had written about that before, but I didn't want the book to be hinged upon just that scandal. I wanted to say that the priesthood itself has problems that antedated that scandal and will follow after it. So I don't want to pin it down to that. And yet, of course, I had to take that into consideration because it's so shocking. And it shows the general message of the book that there's a monarchic monopoly of holiness in the priesthood. That it's a higher calling than the laity. It's set apart. It's beyond criticism. Uh, and that was true for lots of reasons that are very bad long before the sexual crisis. But of course, that's a very important part of it now. Mm -hmm. And we, I grew up being told a priest has to be celibate because he cares for the church and for the gospel. 
and for the poor, and not just for his family. As if there's a hydraulics of love. If you love your, your church, you can't love others. Uh, you know, whereas most of us know that if you're a loving person, that spills over. The, the, and the more loving you are to your family, the more loving you are to others. But then that, that ran up against the harsh truth. If that were true, how could priests not only abuse children, but their superiors protect them? They didn't care about the children. They protected them for the prerogative of the priesthood, for the reputation of the church. That's what they were really dedicated to. It was not love of the gospel. And of course, that's what happens when you build an institution that's monarchic, patriarchal, uh, exclusive. And so the papacy became a monarchy in the Middle Ages in a very understandable way. All authority was monarchical. That finally had to be torn away from it in the 19th century from Pius IX. And they said, no, you can't rule Italy and much of Europe. That's all going to be taken away from you. He said, you can't do that. That's part of God's gift to me. Well, they took that away. And then he said, well, we can't be the monarch, but we can say only Catholicism can be the recognized church in any Catholic world. And that was taken away finally in the, in the Second Vatican Council. But this attempt to hold authority over others, which was built very early into the priesthood and grew and grew and grew, is what made otherwise wonderful people, I know some of those people, cover up for the priests, thinking that's the only way they can protect the church, and protecting the church mean, means protecting God, as if God needed protection. You know, they're, they're the ones who are saying God can take care of himself, uh, but they're also saying, oh, you can't, you can't scandalize people. Scandal is a terribly powerful world, word in the Catholic world. When parents went to priests and said, to bishops and said, a priest has abused my son. Uh, this was a terrible sin. Of course, it was a crime, too. They didn't report it to the police. They reported it to their bishop, and the bishop should have taken care of it. But what he normally said was, that's horrible. We'll try to correct it, but don't tell anybody, because you will that will cause scandal to the church. And causing scandal to the church was kind of the ultimate sin in that world. Well, clearly the church had lost its way, but many Catholics would say you have to distinguish between those who were corrupt inside the church and, quote, unquote, the way, which they still believe is valid. Do you make that distinction? Oh, so do. Absolutely. So do I. After all, the church is not the pope and not the governors, the rulers of the church, it's the people of God. That's the Second Vatican Council's teaching, and it was St. Augustine's teaching from the fourth, fourth century on. The church is the body of Christ, ruled by the Spirit. You know, when I, when I first criticized popes, I got a lot of people saying to me, well, yes, the church is the people of Christ, the body of Christ, the people of God, but a people has to have a head, and the pope is the head. And I thought, what a blasphemy. The head of the body of Christ is Christ, not the Pope. Uh, to put him into that role was the result of all of these centuries of distortion. So, of course, I think that the church will last. Priests will last. Priests doing the wonderful things they've done. I've, I say in the book, and I have lived in my life, friendship with many admirable priests, some of the most saintly people I know. Uh, and I can separate them out from the institutional authoritarianism of the church the same way I do other people in the church who have been prophets and leaders in my own church uh, that I go to, which is a campus church at Northwestern University. We've had priests come and go, four or five, they're appointed by bishops. We have no say over that. They come and go, uh, which was not the original arrangement in the church. But we've had two women, successively, who were there all that time, who prepared people for catechism, who prepared people for marriage. One of them preached homilies. Uh, and so 
they were the voice of the community in a way that the priest was not. The priest was a voice in some ways. You know, the priest was the teacher because for a long time only priests could be theologians. It was taught only in Latin. It was only authorized. Other books were uh, put on the index so that the laity had no say in the matter. Well, now they do. One of the women who preaches a homily at our church is a theology, theology student who's getting degrees. Uh, so the church will go on, but it will not exclude other people. You know, when they say, some people say to me, well, if you don't think the pope is the boss, you must be a Protestant. And they've got me because I say, no, that's true. I'm no better than a Protestant. <laughs> but, a Protestant but a Protestant is no better than a Catholic. We're all part of the followers of Jesus. And we should not say, stop the way the first disciples did uh, to other people, so that Jesus will say, why did you say that? He's on my side. If he's on my side, uh, you, he's, he can't be against you. Well, let me follow up from that then. I get Martin Luther, of course, launched the Protestant Reformation, which took power away from the priests and challenged transubstantiation, which, as you tell us in your book, is one of the more important themes in Catholicism. The Catholic Church strongly opposed the Reformation, of course, and I wonder whether you think the Church would be stronger today if it would have embraced the Reformation rather than rejected it. Well, you know, I don't rewrite history. I teach history, but I don't rewrite it and I don't speculate about its future. Uh, as a believer, I believe that the spirit was at work both in Luther and in the Catholic Church. As before that, it had been at work both in the Western Church and in the Eastern Church. Remember, we've had that tremendous split too. Luther was a kind of latecomer in, in terms of splitting the church. Splitting the church never made sense in terms of the gospel. So I have my arguments with Luther as I had my arguments with those who condemned him. But uh, I would worship and pray with all of them uh, so long as they are followers of Jesus, loving the poor, doing what the gospel said, and therefore not being priestly in the sense that the Jewish prophets condemned the priests. You know, Luther became just as much a priest of his own religion as the Catholics had been of theirs. Uh, it's true he didn't like transubstantiation, but he said consubstantiation was fine, which is just as objectionable, it seems to me. But the point is to get beyond these sectarian, divisive, owning Jesus. You know, they, the disciples who came back to Jesus said, he was doing good things in your name, but he wasn't some of, one of us, so he didn't own you the way we own you. So owning Jesus is what various Christianities have done. Uh, other Christians, uh, they say, we, don't, we own Jesus. You don't. Nobody owns Jesus. He owns us. Well, let me follow up on, uh, because you've talked about so-called priestly imperialism during our conversation here, and I'd like to read another excerpt of your book, which deals with this. Uh, control room, I'm on uh, the middle of page three. This, like most of the sacraments, is more an institution for the priestly controlling of life than a reflection of Jesus in the Gospels. When it was decreed that Catholics must receive the Eucharist at least once a year, a corollary of that was an injunction to go to confession at least once a year if one had committed any mortal sin since one's last communion. The sacramental system makes all its parts interconnect, and the central node of the whole system is what Aquinas called, quote, the sacrament of sacraments, the Eucharist. Let me follow from that by asking this. Why do you think it's important to understand the Eucharist in order to understand the Catholic priesthood? Well, in a sense, that's what really put me on this path of uh, investigating the gospel. For the last 30 years, I've been studying and writing about and translating and writing on St. Augustine. And one of the things that struck me very early on was that Augustine did not believe that the Eucharist was the literal body and blood of Jesus. He thought the body of Christ is the people. 
and that there's a very broad literature uh, literature about that. Uh, so he said, "How could it be, the body of Christ, when the body of Christ offered you the bread as a symbol?" You know, at the Last Supper, he said to you, "Take my body." Well, it, it was his body that was giving them the bread. He didn't mean it literally. Don't eat my arm that's giving you this bread. And so he said, when you celebrate the communion meal, which they've done from the beginning, it's you on the altar that is being united with Jesus. Uh, and when he gave out communion, he said to the recipient, receive the body of Christ, receive what you are. You're the body of Christ. Uh, so it was many hundreds of years before they tried to, find, to say this was a literalistic, fundamentalist reading. If he says it's the body of Christ, it's the literal body and blood of Jesus. It's there, there physically. Uh, well, that doesn't make any sense. And it was reduced to such absurdity that St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century said, Every, there's a transubstantia. One substance leaves, the bread leaves, and the body of Jesus comes in under the accidents of bread and wine. And therefore, any little particle of bread, any little droplet of wine is the whole of Jesus. And therefore, if you drop some crumb, you've got to get it and consume it or burn it or protect it, uh, and, and he went into elaborate uh, scenarios. If a n mouse nibbles it, do you have to eat the rest? If not, what do you do? do you, can you burn it? Or uh, if a fly is dropped into the chalice and you take it out, it's drenched in the blood of Jesus. What do you do with that? Well, you have to wipe it off and put the cloth in the tabernacle and burn the fly. You know, for, for hundreds of years, people believed such absurd things. And now there's a gradual realization that it's a symbolic act. When I was young, we went to benediction where they took the host out and adored it separately from the meal entirely, put it in a monstrance, incensed it, knelt to it, sang hymns to it. Uh, that's disappearing. The idea of a crumb hunt is disappearing. You know, that now normal bread is used, and if there are any crumbs, nobody goes hunting for them. So these uh, common sense views of what Jesus was up to are returning to Catholics and others. Polls show that a very literalistic believing of the, that this is the physical body and blood of Jesus is fading very rapidly among young Catholics as it faded among Protestants a long time ago. Remember, even Luther thought that, well, it was the body and blood of Jesus, but it was also the body and blood of bread and wine. They were consubstantiated. Uh, so <laughs> they've, they've even moved away from that. Lutherans have moved away from that the way we've moved away from transubstantiation. So is it your view that in uh, a generation or two, transubstantiation will no longer be a feature of the Catholic Church? Not in the doctrinal sense. You know, the pure substance accident Aristotelian distinction, that's been fading for a long time because most people don't understand it. How many ordinary Catholics are Aristotelians who know the difference between substance and accidents? And of course, that was a distortion of Aristotle to begin with. Aristotle said, a substance is not the same thing as an, abs as an accident because, for instance, you can have a dog, it can be white or black, big or small, Labrador or Peking geese. Those are accidental, but the substance uh, is the dog. Well, he said you could separate them and distinguish them, but you could never really separate them in the sense you could have a dog with no accidents, who's neither big nor small, nor you can have accidents, smallness without dogness. Thomas came along and said, well, you can have Jesusness without bread and wineness, which is a distortion of Aristotle, but it was used to give this kind of intellectual glamour uh, to something that's a, a mysteriously spiritual teaching and reduced it to a rationalistic, I think quite absurd 
teaching. The title of your book asks the question, why priests? And I want to ask you, if your version of modern Catholicism were not to include priests, paint us a picture. What does it look like? It would look like the church that Paul wrote to. He said, the gifts of the Spirit are many. There are, you have readers, healers, prophets, teachers, speakers in tongues. We already are beginning to have that. Now, deacons, because there are so few priests, deacons are taking over, women are taking over. And of course, prophets meant in that time not predicting the future as it does now. It was the Jewish prophet who says, wait a minute to the priests, you're not observing the law. You're not keeping the spirit of the law under all this ritualistic nonsense. So we will have, it, there was for a long time a monopoly on theology, on understanding the truths of the faith. Only priests could do it because only they were trained in Latin. And the laity was neither trained nor Latin speaking. Now that's no longer true. So we have a whole group of people who are students of theology of Jesus, teaching us who are not necessarily priests. So priests, as long as they are teachers, healers, what all these other things are, are fine. But uh, these other people can break into that monopoly and do the same things that uh, leaders do in other Christian communities. We've got about five minutes left, Mr. Wilson. I want to try to put one more thing on the table here, and that is this. I'm going to share some numbers with you and our viewers from the 2011 National Household Survey from Statistics Canada, which is our, I guess it's like your Bureau of Labor Statistics, or part of it anyway in the States, uh, really uh, figures out what's going on in the country. And here are some numbers about, if I can put it this way, who's up and who's down in religion. Admittedly, this is only in Canada. If you look at Christian Orthodox, their numbers are up almost 15%. If you look at Catholics, it's basically status quo, off half a point. Anglicans, however, off almost 20%. And United Church members off almost 30%. And that's uh, from 2011, looking back over the previous decade. How do you interpret those numbers? Well, I think all of religion is under suspicion now uh, for a number of reasons. It has disgraced itself in many ways. Secular knowledge, which was despised or condemned for a long time by Christians of all faiths, has established itself quite uh, convincingly in the areas where it is sound. The church fought science, fought Galileo, fought uh, Freud, fought all those, fought, fought Darwin, uh, and of course those are winning. The question is, are we going to be only a scientific and a secular culture? Is there a spiritual, uh, supernatural reality manifested sometimes in poetry, sometimes in philosophy, sometimes in theology, and sometimes in religion, which can oppose this scientistic culture. Without excluding it or denying its validity, I think there is because I see people do it. I try to do it. Uh, so in that sense, all religions are in the same fight, which is my point. Well, let me jump Why in here for a we? second because your, your friend, the theologian George Weigel, would say that's not quite accurate. He'd say, that the religions that require more from you are doing better, and the religions that are more liberal and quote unquote require less from you are fading. Has he got a point? Well, no. He has a very selective group that he uh, cites in that. There is uh, a retardative Catholic culture, and there is a non enlightenment culture that's being ap appealed to outside Europe. Uh, but to say that you can win by saying the enlightenment is totally wrong and we were always totally right seems to me a very bad bet. <laughs> well, he also, well, this is a hard one to get into with just a minute to go here, but let me try anyway. 
He does say, uh, not only on this program, but also in his book, Evangelical Catholicism, uh, that uh, there are some things in, in Catholicism that he's sorry to say just aren't up for debate. And if you want to call yourself a Catholic, you just have to accept these truths. You're not buying that, eh? <laughs> well, there's a long, long history of not buying that. You know, the idea that the, you had to be a papist to be a Catholic didn't apply in the Middle Ages because Dante put three popes in hell, Orcagna and other painters painted them in hell. There was always a Catholic church outside the narrow papist believing, uh, and it became narrower and narrower and narrow in the 19th century, and it's narrower even now, and Weigel is clinging on to that little bit and thinking it's everything. Well, we're going to hear from the man himself. In the meantime, we uh, thank you for coming on our program and discussing your latest book, Why Priests, A Failed Tradition. Gary Wills, it's good of you to join us on the line from Chicago, Illinois. Thanks so much. Surely. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.